content warning for basically everything you can think of, but especially racism, misogyny, and rape. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. Time is the early 1950s and the Cold War is raging, a deadly game of chess with all the world as the board. Espionage is the name of the game, with the US and Russia the rising players. Britain still dreams of empire, but within a few years the Suez Crisis will mark, for most historians, the moment when the British realized they were no longer the masters of the world. But in 1953, a mere month after the death of Stalin, a spy novel called Casino Royale hit the stands. It purported to be hard-boiled realism. In fact, its author had studied spycraft and worked in naval intelligence. Yet it was a kind of fantasy novel. A fantasy for post-war Britain. A fantasia of abundance and luxury. Food, cars, beautiful women, and gambling. With one of the most enviable heroes in all of pulp fiction. An adventurer combining the traditions of Sherlock Holmes and Philip Marlowe with a dash of Doc Savage, but with a brutal edge beneath his suave exterior. A hero for the new age of deception and treachery. The name's Bond. James Bond. Hello there. Welcome to What Mad Universe. I'm Adam Prosser. With me as always is Philip Rice. Hello. And uh, today, so we're taking on uh, nothing particularly obscure this week. We're taking on, uh, you know, one of the most well-known uh, stories in the world, the James Bond series, uh, particularly the novels, obviously. Yeah. Uh, everyone's seen the movies, but uh, we were, we, you know, we hadn't, or I had not read the books, and neither had Phil, I believe. No, I had started uh, Casino Royale a while, but we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so we decided to sort of go back to the beginning and look at the books, which are kind of different. Um, Ian Fleming, who wrote the books, uh, was, uh, he actually died only, uh, you know, a, a, a year or two after they first started adopting them, uh, after uh, Dr. No, the Sean Connery movie came out. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's, you know, he didn't, there's, in some ways they're, they're a very different animal than, than the movies. Very different. Yeah. In, uh, in, in some ways they're kind of, you can see the movies growing out of the books, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, I mean, among other things, uh, there's, there's, uh, tw I guess 12 novels and two collections of short stories. Yeah. Um, they're, uh, all the the names of the order uh, were they were completely arranged for the movies. Mm. Uh, Doctor knows the sixth book, but it's the first James Bond movie, um, and the, there's no the continuity is all over the place and the and everything and yeah. uh, it's basically. Um, it's it's you know they're they're fairly episodic anyway, but there is a bit of a continuity later on, which is thrown out for the for the movies, and of course the movies become completely insane and over the top as they keep going. <laughs> uh, eventually, Moon but that's in some of the books as well. There's hints of it. Yeah, no, yeah, they're they're always sort of I guess the starting point of the book uh, or uh, the the starting point of the movie comes from the book, but I well, mean, I mean. S for like Moonraker has nothing to do with the that, book. That that was the one I was thinking of was Moonraker <laughs> because that was the one where Star Wars had just come out and they needed yeah. the space themed one, so they yeah. did the, they did Moonraker. That but, that was uh, we'll get to my opinion of these novels uh, in a minute, but uh, that that was one that I preferred the book to the movie because right. I hate that movie. Yes, uh, Moonraker. Yes. Well, that's uh, not considered a bit of a, a high point uh, no. for the James Bond series. When I was a kid, I loved the the goofy, silly ones more than anything else. Obviously, I I, I liked um, well for the movies. I tend to prefer the grittier stuff, 
Um, uh, like, you know, not necessarily completely gritty, but, uh, like, I liked, um, um, actually, I should say my background with this. Um, I didn't really grow up watching James Bond movies, but, um, about five years ago, I decided I would just watch them all, and I spent a summer watching every single movie, uh, both the official Eon Productions and non-official ones like the the first adaptation which mm. was casino royale right uh which was produced in the 50s for a tv show called climax right and uh that was appropriately uh, enough yeah that was um uh barry nelson playing uh an american agent named jimmy bond mm-hmm. and there was clarence Leiter as his uh secret service friend oh Okay. So they re- just reverse the nationalities of the. Oh, and Clarence is is, is Felix. Uh, yeah, uh, is Felix, and he's British in that. Yeah. Version. Oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's they cool. they left out the ball torture, um, <laughs> yes. which you know it was a TV show. So right. Uh, and then uh, that led to the rights for Casino Royale alone being owned by another company. Right. That was made into a comedy and in, in yeah. an alleged comedy in 1967. <laughs> Terrible movie. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It starred uh, David Niven, David who would Niven. have been a good James Bond in a you know actual movie, but right. uh, but it also had a bunch like everybody was named James Bond. That yeah. was one of the jokes. Peter Sellers was in it. Right? Yeah, Peter Sellers and played Woody James Allen. Bond. Um, Woody Allen played played James Bond. It was just a mess. It yeah. was it had no cohesion. But yeah. anyway, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It is. Uh, it is. It, yes, it was significant that there that uh, Casino Royale was adapted it to this uh, for this uh, 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 TV show. That's kind of an anthology show where they would stage different novels and different adapt different things uh, in the fifties, which is why it was never owned uh, by the people who own the rights to all the other Bond novels. So uh, until until the Daniel right, Craig until, movie, of course, it, obviously, yeah. So Casino Royale has technically been adapted for the screen three times. Uh, technically, technically, as a TV show, once as this completely insane thing that they made in the sixties, and then properly finally with uh, Daniel Craig, and that's my personal pick for the best James Bond movie as well, the the, the Daniel Craig uh, Casino Yeah, it was pretty good. Um, anyway, but let's go back to the beginning here. So um, basically, uh, they were novels. They were written by a guy named Ian Fleming, uh, who was born in 1908 to a wealthy family of merchant bankers. Um, his father was Valentine Fleming, who was an MP. He was killed in World War I. Um, Ian Fleming had a very, you know, rich kid upbringing. He went to Eton College, which is the... Uh, the college that's known for you know the 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 the, the scions of wealth and privilege tend mm, to go to has and, an accent named after it. Uh, yes, that's right, and it's sort of it's you're supposed to learn an entire mode of behavior when you mm. go to Eton College, basically. Um, then he he did apparently later they were planning to uh, get him into the uh, the civil service and the the whole machinery of the military industrial complex. Uh, they sent him to a private school in Austria, r- which was run by a former British spy named. Uh, Ehrman Forbes Dennis and his wife Phyllis Bottom, who was a uh, novelist. So and that sounds like a Bond girl name. It does sound like a Bond girl name, and it also sounds like you know it was a spy and a female novelist. And you're like, okay, so that's where he got all of his yeah. entire career uh, was mapped out by those people. It's hard not to assume that. Um, anyway, but he actually had he didn't do well in school, and he had trouble in school, which is something they uh, he wrote about Bond later as well that yeah. he didn't do well in school, and he kept getting into affairs uh, sometimes with sometimes with married women, and mm-hmm. I think that was uh, you know that may have been although. I I don't know if that's ever been said about Fleming himself, but uh, specifically, but I think he's kind of hinting at that uh, with mm-hmm. Bond's backstory. Uh, actually, he did uh, eventually end up uh, marrying a woman who had been married when they were uh, together, <laughs> but uh, that that was after the war. Uh, in World War II, of course, he was uh, he was a spy. He worked in naval intelligence, although it sounds like he was a little more behind a desk, uh, but he did go out in the field a bit. Uh, he was the personal assistant to the director of naval intelligence. Uh, he proposed a, a couple of really strange, over-the-top uh, plans. He was involved in uh, the Bureau of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which I, lo- <laughs> I always have to love that title with. Um, and, uh, you know, he had all these plans to leak, basically, fake ID- uh, intelligence to the enenemy. Uh, there was something called Operation Goldeneye in 1941-42, uh, which was about maintaining an intelligence network in Spain. And, um, uh, of course... Uh 
his uh, ranch in Jamaica was named Goldeneye, right. and then eventually the uh, movie Goldeneye. Right, that's where that was from. As the as the Bond movies went on, they they were basically taking different names that were associated with Ian Fleming and James Bond in different ways because they didn't have titles from the movies anymore. Or the books. Yes, uh, or the books. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> so he had an affair with uh, yeah with Anne Charteris. He was apparently they were together. Uh, they they he sort of broke it off with her. She got married to. The Viscount Rothermere, which is the most British thing I've ever heard. Uh, and then they got back together, had an affair, and she left the Viscount and married Ian Fleming. Um, and uh, yeah, he worked as a journalist. And otherwise, after World War II, he just sort of uh, decided he was going to write a book, um, which he, 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 wasn't, he didn't seem to have a high opinion of it before it got published. He called it his Ophis, Ophish Opus. Um, and he got it through, as everything else he seems to have gotten in life, he got it through family connections. Uh, but, uh, it was published. It was moderately successful, uh, in Britain for a while, but I think it didn't burst out. Uh, the, the first few books were moderately successful in Britain, but then I think, uh, they broke through in America around the time of Dr. No, uh, the book. Yeah. And, um, that's when it sort of exploded as a, uh, as a, as a phenomenon, and uh, ironically, Fleming only lived another 10 years or so uh, after that. He died of a heart attack. He was very young. He was only about 90, uh, 56 years old, I think. Um, but he lived long enough to see Sean Connery play James Bond, and that did influence uh, the last couple of novels he mentioned. Yeah, he becomes Scottish. He becomes Scottish. Uh, it's supposedly sort of his personality. He was He's a little more wisecracking as the books go mm. on, and that's from uh, Sean Connery, apparently. Um it, it became more of a movie phenomenon than a book phenomenon at that point, although they did uh, continue to write Bond novels uh, beyond his uh, his thing. Uh, yeah, we didn't read them. No, yeah, it was, uh, I believe, Kingsley Amos who continued to know. write the novels for a while. Uh, and they've, they're, uh, to, as far as I know, they're still pumping, <laughs> pumping them out to this day, but they're, uh, you know, sort of semi-official uh, James Bond novels. And, of course, he is actually now in the public domain in, uh, in Canada, interestingly enough. Yeah, um, so there was plans to, or they were talking about making a movie adaptation uh, just for Canadian audiences with an English actor, but an, a Canadian Bond girl. Huh. Um, I think it was uh, supposed to be uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, because that takes place in Canada. Right, yes. She's um, French-Canadian. Yeah, the, um, the and there was talk of, I, I forget her name, but she played uh, uh, Don Draper's wife on um, on Mad Men. Yes, I know who you're talking about, um, yes. The, um, she was, she's Quebecois, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Who, uh, yes, she would have been good at it, but it, I I haven't heard anything about that right. in years. So well, I I've got to imagine even if it's sort of technically legal, there are some powerful and wealthy people who don't want that to happen. Basically, yeah, <laughs> I've been wanting to do something with James Bond for a while, and when I found that out, I was thinking about what I could do. Yeah. But I always publish my comics digitally, so yeah, that would go into the United, you know. Yeah. be under United States copyright as well. So. Right, right, yeah. And of course, uh, James Bond does appear in uh, Alan Moore's uh, League of Extraordinary as Gentlemen. Jimmy. As Jimmy. As, as, well, th that's, again, to sort of skate around the copyright a bit. Yeah. Uh, it's clearly James Bond. I do believe they make it clear he is James Bond. Yeah, he's the uh, he's the grandson of Champion Bond, who was in the yeah. first volume. That's right. And and it's it's actually interesting because my understanding, uh, I, I might have this wrong, uh, is that there's a bit of a proto- uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen tie uh, in the Bond novels themselves, like that uh, M was supposed to be basically the person who had inherited the role that was founded by um, uh, Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock Holmes's brother, in the... Uh, in yeah, the, I didn't get a sense of that. The, well, it's, no, it's not in the books, but apparently that was something that... Uh, um, uh, Fleming suggested outside of the thing oh, okay. that it was, and uh, I mean, Alan Moore uh, tied Doctor No to being Fu Manchu's grandson as well at one point, I believe. Uh, um, I can't remember, but it did say that the Doctor No incident was was completely fabricated. Right, right. But he he he. When it's initially discussed in the Black Dossier, oh, okay. which is the spy related one, they said, "Oh, I believe it was a the grandson of one of the people your lot tangled oh, with okay. back in the 1970s." So they were implying that he was. Fu There's Man a lot of details grandson. in those books. It's yeah. hard to remember everything. That's right. But, yeah. Well, yeah, he, exactly. He's trying to tie everything. But yeah, there. the uh, the Bond in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is actually a villain. Right. Like he's a bad guy because Alan Moore does not like these books and. Mm -hmm. Uh, spoiler alert! Neither did I. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> no, you weren't. Yeah, uh, yeah. The the bond in those in that comic is not that is not far off enough 
uh, for comfort, I think. Yeah. He's pretty... Right. He's he got his number. Yeah. Yeah, well, that that is one of the interesting things, because you read Casino Royale, and Bond definitely, more than most of the other books, actually, uh, he definitely comes off very badly in Casino Royale as, like, very misogynist. Yeah. Um, like, and, and to well, the point where, like, he literally, as soon as he hears he's going to have a woman working with him, he kind of goes, oh, some bitch is going to be in my yeah, way, basically. Yeah, he calls her a bitch immediately. Yeah. He's... And it ends with him saying, um, yeah. the bitch is dead now, yeah, which right. was in the movie, but yeah. in the movie it makes more, like, Right. It just makes more sense in the movie because he didn't say that from the beginning. Mm. Well, the thing is, in the book, the way I read it was kind of like, he's this misogynist guy. And I, Ian Fleming seems to have had issues. Um, yeah, uh, can we go over some of these quotes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so there will be a, a content warning at the beginning of this episode, I'm sure, but... I yeah. want to put an extra content warning here for <laughs> yes. some stuff I'm going to read. Yeah, there's some... Uh... Uh, yeah, it gets pretty nasty here. Um, okay, Casino Royale. This is the narrator on Bond's sex with Vesper Lind. Mm -hmm. The conquest of her body, because of the central privacy in her, would have the sweet tang of rape. All right. Mm -hmm. That's bad <laughs> enough, but then it gets worse. Uh, yeah. uh, Darko Kareem, who's um, the head of uh, the... Turkey section of the uh, uh, Secret Service, a character who I believe we're supposed to like, yeah, uh, says things like, uh, "All women want to be swept off their feet. In their dreams, they long to be slung over a man's shoulder and taken into a cave and raped." Right. He goes on to talk about. I'm not going to read off this entire yeah, thing here. Don't but, read off the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um. It is. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, and so on. <laughs> yeah, and so on. <laughs> the, he. It was definitely. So this is what's. An, in, uh, an interesting question to me. Uh, I feel that he wanted James Bond to be kind of uh, a, 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 a monster in Casino Royale. And he did think, I think he did think of him to, to a certain degree that way. But at the same time, um, he, you know, his own views weren't far enough apart from James yeah. Bond uh, to really distinguish well, that. There's also, um, and I found some information on uh, Fleming said, uh, about Bond, exotic things would happen to and around him, but he wouldn't. Uh, but he would be a neutral figure. And he also said, uh, when I wrote the first one, 1953, I wanted Bond to be an extremely dull, uninteresting man mm -hmm. to whom things happened. I wanted him to be a blunt instrument. Right. And yeah. that line's used a lot in the movies, but right. uh, um, and it shows up in the books eventually yeah. too. He calls him a blunt instrument. But um, uh, sorry, what? Yeah. Well, it's no, you're right. Like he was supposed to be sort of a, uh, I guess a, a dull I, every man, but it, it too much of Fleming came through. I think. Well, I I think um, it's even the thing uh, as they say the reader insert character, the character mm -hmm. who you can imagine yourself as someone. And I, I from what I recall, um, he got the name James Bond from a, yeah, a ornithology book, book. An yeah. ornithology book, because he thought it sounded boring. Right, exactly. And that a spy should have a boring name because right. they'd fit in better. Right, and and there's that makes a lot of sense. I think that's actually kind of interesting the way he lays that out. But then in Casino Royale, Bond is very much more or less as we know him, uh, but a little more on the overtly bastardly side, I guess. I guess, uh, and, yeah. and I read Casino Royale. If you just read Casino Royale in isolation, I kind of read it as the story of a guy who's, you know, he's a misogynist, he's a jerk. He meets a girl and he actually sort of, it makes him kind of want to be better. And then she basically betrays him and dies. And that, and by the end, he's back to being a bit of a monster. Uh, that that's my, Maybe that's my reading into it, but that that's how I interpreted Casino Royale. Um, as the series goes on, then he's, you know, he's James Bond, the action hero who everyone wants to be. And, uh, but then again, when you get to the end or near the end of the series, Live and Let Die, one of the last books, um, it actually sort no, of... No, Live and Let Die is the second book. I, you mean... Um, I'm sorry. Um, um, you, you only, only live twice. twice. I'm sorry. sorry. I keep a lot of the names are a bit similar. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. All the words, all the ones with die in the title. When you get to You Only Live Twice, uh, that's where, um, uh, they, they kind of suggest that uh, like Bond, and at that point he's been married to a woman who was killed uh, by Blofeld. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but it kind of suggests that, you know, he needs to leave his life behind. That, hence the title of the book, right? Um, and he literally ends the book with amnesia, ready to start kind of a new life, basically. Thinking he's a Japanese fisherman. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that was from the book. That was in the yeah. movie as well, and it's yeah. it's even more ridiculous in the movie because it's yeah. Sean Connery is six two and hairy, and yeah, yeah. They, they actually did that on Venture Brothers once. Right. Uh, they had um, uh, Doctor Venture's father uh, do a sort of Bond villain, like he was infiltrating a Bond villain group, uh-huh. and uh, he was disguised as a Japanese man. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And the the leader kept saying. Thank you, my surprisingly hair suit Japanese friend. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, it's a, that's it is a little ridiculous. Thank I you, mean, my friend who is easily easily 6 a foot 2. <laughs> yeah, it's well the, you know, it, it plays I guess maybe li- slightly less ridiculous in prose. You can almost buy it a little bit more, uh, but no, I, I know. know after having seen the movie that was kind of exactly. I couldn't take that seriously. Yeah, once you see the movie. And I I'm not a hundred percent sure you were meant to think that oh yeah he thought he was Japanese just that he'd ended up with these people but anyway it's but I other can... people think he's Japanese at certain yeah. points so it's just yeah <laughs> it's not very well thought out <laughs> apparently it's just from shaving his eyebrows in the book at a certain to a certain and a haircut degree. and a haircut makes everyone think he's Japanese to the point where Blofeld doesn't initially recognize him and thinks yeah. he's Jap- he might be Japanese um, anyway but it did sort anyway it, it sort of suggests that yes Bond is kind of this flawed protagonist and I, I i my understanding is fleming kind of got sick of bond himself and didn't like bond very much by the end uh, i can't blame him he was getting into some kind of you know you know darker thoughts and so on um and um that sort of what's suggested in the last couple books that he's kind of he's almost trying to help bond escape from himself so there's an there is actually a theme that runs through the books whether it's completely subconscious or whether it was intended of just sort of you know, he's a jerk, he's an awful person, maybe it would be better if he <laughs> evolved into someone else. And again, it's it's that sort of idea of, uh, you know, I'm I'm a jerk, he's the jerk, but he's the jerk on our side, uh, who we need to, to fight the bigger monsters, basically. I guess. Um, I, I think, so, yeah, that's the question of to what degree is that intended. He's always described as having, uh, you know, handsome, cruel face, for yeah. instance. Um, anyway, to what degree is it intended and to what degree is it, uh, you know something that Fleming just wrote in because he was trying to make him kind of a fantasy figure and people appealed to it. Mm -hmm. Um, He was criticized a lot at the time in the 60s. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a uh, a guy named Paul Johnson who wrote a review in the New Statesman and called it sex snobbery and sadism. Um, (laughs) And that sort of, that became the, uh, the, the framework for, uh, for James, for people who criticized James Bond Uh, you know, it was that those were the elements that, uh, and it, like I say, it seemed like because it's a pulp novel, you you sort of play to the the elements that your audience is reacting to, and it kind of feels like uh, that he might have just been going, "Oh, let's give him what they want: sex, snobbery, and sadism, and <laughs> yeah. long lists of the things he consumes." Yes, yes. Uh, so you know, you know the um, <laughs> uh, standard, you know, martini, shaken nut, stir, vodka, martini, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I don't drink, so all these descriptions of of alcohol just doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, you know, well, that specific, you know, uh, his drink, and there's the Vesper in the first book. Right. Uh, Which is also in the movie. He describes yeah, also in the, the movie. The Vesper. With the uh, lemon peel and all that. Mm-hmm. He's like that with everything. Yes. Like, it's like Rob, like Patrick Bateman lists of <laughs> lists of things he's he's taking in, and yep. it's obviously just stuff Fleming likes. Yes. No, so much of the book is like Ian Fleming on vacation, and he's yeah. recounting his vacation and throwing in some action scenes, basically. Yeah. Uh, in particular, and he like he, I mean, you can tell he had a home in Jamaica because right. a lot of it takes place in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like live and let die. I actually got it right this time. Yeah. Uh, there's so, there's a bunch of scuba diving in that one, and it's like, oh, Ian Fleming went scuba diving before yeah. he wrote this novel, you know. And uh, you know, and then there's when he starts talking about cars and all the. I guess he went to Japan before he wrote "You Only Live Twice." Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, the um, you know they're skiing in uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah. Uh, again, it all just sort of plays like a go- the golfing in Goldfinger. Oh God, <laughs> that was that just that becomes extremely boring if you're not into golf. The the whole yeah he, he that's how he like, matches wits like with Goldfinger. Watching golf, but even bore- more boring. <laughs> yeah, he devotes at least a couple chapters to uh, defeating. And, and they're both Goldfinger. cheating. So like, what's even the point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's uh, that's where it's interesting because Goldfinger is one of the pulpier novels. He sort of weaves back and forth mm-hmm. between. I like the 
like I said, I like the grittier stuff in the movies, mm -hmm. but in the books, I definitely gravitated towards the cartoonish. Right. So, like, Dr. No and mm -hmm. Goldfinger and, mm -hmm. um, like, obviously those books still had a lot of problems, but right. uh, I tended to... Uh, enjoy them a bit more because they weren't taking themselves as seriously. Right. Yeah. It, it does feel like he, the early, the first one, Casino Royale, and maybe to an extent, Live and Let Die, maybe. Um, but they like Moon. By the time of Moonraker, he's got what we'd call a classic Bond villain in Hugo Drax. Yeah. I a, actually, uh, you know, he was a Nazi. Like right, he was yeah. like a good like. Uh, good foe for somebody to fight so right. like say what you will about fleming he did not he did not like nazis no i mean hey he, he yeah. fought them yeah and uh and this was so it although it's it's actually interesting that in moonraker it starts with james bond going wow i get to meet hugo drac he's a fanboy for hugo drax yeah. who's i guess the elon musk of his day i and guess <laughs> everyone's you know enthralled by all this great uh, space equipment that he's building but it's all part of a plan because he's a nazi who was able to uh infiltrate infiltrate yeah. he, he basically he was found uh kind of the same backstory as le chiffre in casino royale actually or the the backstory le chiffre gives because he's just faking right and Oh, yeah, sorry, they're both faking amnesia. Yeah, yeah well, that's just it. Yeah, he's, like, he's found after the war, he's all messed up. Uh, in both cases, they're a bit... Uh, Drax was all burned up, I believe. Yeah. And they said, oh, who are you? And they decided he was this guy, Hugo Drax, but he was actually a Nazi who was pretending to be amnesiac so he could infiltrate, build a giant rocket that was going to nuke London, basically. Yeah. Um, working, <laughs> working... He was working with the communists because commie Nazis, of yeah. course, are everywhere. <laughs> Well, everybody was was Russian and all the villains, like even Goldfinger was a smash agent. Right, yes. Which I found really weird. This hyper-capitalist guy was... Yeah, well, that's just it. It's kind of... Uh, and apparently Fleming literally went to Russia while Stalin was in charge and had, had observed that uh, for a while. But it is... He created Smirsh... We should explain Smirsh's... Um... Uh, well, Smirsh uh, existed, but it wasn't... It was heavily fictionalized. Right. Smirsh is... Uh, Means uh, death to spies in, or it's a it's a combination of two words that right. means death to spies in Russia, roughly yeah. in Russian. Of, and uh, it was a real organization, but uh, Fleming sort of made it into the KGB and all sort of an all powerful. Yeah, the idea being they were the counter spy network, yeah. and therefore they were going to be the ones who were hunting James Bond more than anything. And uh, it's it's actually interesting. One of the things that's actually interesting is always seeing real world politics kind of bubble up and 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 mix in with the books because literally Stalin died right before the first book was published. Uh, the first book or two mentions Stalin because I guess publishing is so such a mm -hmm. slow process. Uh, he must have written the first two or three before Stalin actually died. Um, at one point, by about Moonraker, I think he mentions that Stalin was dead, basically. Um, and then, uh, and then he obviously, he had built up Smirsh as his big arch nemesis for Bond, but then he get, I guess he decided maybe the real world Smirsh stopped existing around that point, or maybe... Uh, yeah, well, in the books anyway, it's, it gets shut down. Right. And, uh, it, it talks about the Cold War dying down, which is interesting, because it's, it is still yeah. the 50s. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I guess it was from the English point of view. I, I'm not sure about that. But. Well, that's just it. I think everyone saw... I, I actually... There was a movie that came out this year called Death of Stalin, which I recommended to Phil to watch. It's a really good movie. I think it's really entertaining. It's by the guys who did... Uh, the guy who did uh, Veep and uh, The, the Thick, Thick of It. The Thick of It, it yeah, yeah. In the Loop. And uh, so it's that. It's the nonsensical politic, political satire, but it's in Russia right after Stalin died, basically. And um, it is interesting because... They, you know, Soviet Russia did get, like, it became it became less of a horrible dictatorship under Stalin. It was still not great, but at least with Stalin dead, it's not hard to th think people went, oh, maybe everything's going to ease off a little bit now, basically. Mm -hmm. um, because it was, he was a one-man show, you know, he was running the Soviet Union. And then um, you can sense in a couple of the books that he didn't quite know what the what the situation was going to be politically. Yeah, uh, and so uh, in comes Spectre. Yes, um, who are better villains anyway? Yeah, better villains, and uh, obviously the movies use them instead of Smirsh. Right. Smirsh is mentioned in one of the movies, I think, mm -hmm. in From Russia with Love. But even in that, uh, the villains were Spectre agents. 
Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie of uh, From Russia with Love. Okay. I I don't remember much about it, but yeah. Yeah. Well, Russia the the book of From Russia with Love is uh, the fifth James Bond novel, and, and it's a second movie. Second movie, and it's much. Uh, it's one of the grittiest books. It's one of the most realistic books, and it feels like that. It, it sounds like that was going to be the send off for James Bond. James Bond is literally poisoned to death at the end of the book, uh, and you know, fading his life is fading and that's the end of the book, which would have been a really weird way to end the series. But I guess he was kind of, he, he felt like the, the books weren't going anywhere and he just wanted to give it a tragic ending. Uh, then apparently they broke through in America right about the time. So it was like, okay, I, sh- I should keep writing these. Uh, but they veer away from any kind of political realism at that point. Yeah. Uh, Dr. No is a full on super villain. So is Goldfinger. Yeah, he's basically just Fu Manchu. Right. Yeah, like you said, it's he's Fu Manchu crossed with uh, the guy from the most dangerous game, which is basically oh, yeah, what, yeah, too, what Doctor yeah. No gets into. Yeah, he gets onto Doctor No's island and he has to, you know, he he sort of puts him through his paces to see <laughs> if I he's think, a worthy adversary. I think the moral of these stories is if you're a super villain, don't cheat at gambling. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's a recurring thing. At least what three of the villains uh, are are sort of identified because of well, t- well, two of them are caught out for being gambling cheats and Le Chief, uh does end up cheating when yeah. Bond is beating him uh, because he uh, you know that as as in the movie it was the plan to bankrupt this guy who's an important uh, agent and get him to come over because he'll be wiped out and he'll everyone will want to kill him so they'll have to bring him over uh, which Bond fails at he kind of fails all through Casino Royale yeah. and several of the books and gets tortured testicularly yes as we as as we you may or may not know um and then yeah, Drax gets like they first he's alerted to Drax uh rather M is not Bond because he plays at M's club uh because Drax he notices Drax is cheating at cards uh, which, to be fair, didn't make a lot of sense because Drax is rich and and has all this. Uh, well, the the idea was it was a psychological thing. Like he hated English, so he wanted to cheat them out of everything he could. Right. But it, yeah. And then Goldfinger is similar sort of right. pathological need to mm-hmm. cheat all the time. So he's cheating at cards, right, in a different way, and cheating at golf later mm-hmm. on in the story. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. That. So and and you know what's interesting is you can tie that into the idea that. Well, these aren't gentlemen, so that's how you know they're bad, basically. Which yeah, is, of I course, guess. the theme. You know, Bond, of course, is a ge- is at least the- super superficially a gentleman. Um, you know, he's put. It's interesting. Bond is not really. I always thought of him as rich. I believe he has a title and he has a family estate and everything. Uh, and yet, he's not rich. And the bo- they kind of flat out say he's not that rich. Yeah, and he, well off they, they give his salary, and it's not that much. Right. I mean, even for sick fifties money, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, he's basically a civil servant in terms right. of his status. Right. And, and they, uh, he, he does get, drive a Bentley, but, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. He gets, he gets tempted away. Like, well, not tempted, but they kind of, there, I think at one point he sort of, he realizes, oh, I could make a lot of money by if this villain, uh, he doesn't get, he doesn't get, the villain doesn't try to bribe him. He's not tempted by a bribe. Uh, but it's something like uh, when he's gambling, he he likes to gamble because he likes found money, which he can then spend. But then, on Her Majesty's Civil uh, Secret Service, he says, "I you know I don't want to be rich. That's a that's a that's a burden, a stone around your neck if you're mm-hmm. rich, basically." Uh, but of course, he's just met uh, Teresa. Uh, what's her last name? Teresa Vance. I can't remember who's the uh, countess, and she's kind of a free spirit, so he's kind of embracing that. Uh, again, she kind of represents maybe him bettering himself a little possibly oh, and then she's uh, immediately killed tracy right tracy yeah okay she's known as tracy but her full name is Teresa. blah blah yeah, blah yeah. um anyway so there's kind of a sense of that um you know like yeah anyway it's interesting because he's basically not a rich guy but he his cover is usually that of a rich guy mm-hmm. so he's essentially living like a millionaire without being a millionaire and having everything financed by the state yeah <laughs> so that's that's another sort of fantasy element if you like of uh, Though, uh, James Bond yeah w- back to his food habits he does eat bacon and eggs a lot he eats bacon and eggs in like every book it's ridiculous you think of J- you hear about James Bond he's like oh he's he's a uh, such a luxury loving guy yeah. and it, the meal he eats the most often is bacon and eggs You'd think it would be caviar, but it, it yeah. explains it explains how he likes his eggs in yeah. detail. Yeah, like he likes brown eggs and yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Like it, there's the the last story that Fleming wrote is uh, 007 in New York, which is a terrible title. Mm-hmm. It's a short story, but it's basically just about his eating habits, and it gives a recipe at the end. Oh, really? 
<laughs> oh, you didn't get to that I didn't one? get to I didn't get to the some of the short stories. Oh, okay. So yeah. But that's Yeah, it ends with a recipe for how he likes his <laughs> eggs. I, I wrote it down here, but I'm not gonna read it. Okay. We'll include that as uh, we'll put that on the on the on the site. You can re- you can use James Bond recipe for eggs. Uh, somebody was mentioning uh on I, when I was mentioning that on Twitter, uh somebody actually had an interesting point, a British guy. Uh he was pointing out that uh in nineteen fifty three, after World during World War Two and then after World War Two, uh, there was a rationing imposed oh, on okay. Britain, yeah. and it, it lasted for many years afterwards. They actually—I didn't realize this until fairly recently—but they didn't. It wasn't like the war ended and they say, "Okay, everyone gets their food again." It took almost ten years for them to roll, repeal rationing. Uh, so that was part of the fantasy as well—the idea that oh, you could have bacon and eggs all the time. Like that was a luxurious meal for the, for the Brits, basically. And that's what—and again, the whole thing of James Bond just being this guy who has all the food, all the wants, all the cars, he can travel you know, all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Uh, because they literally, they just spent almost 10, almost uh, 15 years <laughs> with, you know, extreme limits on what they could do. It didn't, it didn't hit North America as badly. Uh, you know, they had, they had to scrimp and save during the war, but after the war, suddenly their economy was booming. But um, yeah, this, this, uh, this uh, rationing, uh, made it hard, so like eggs were a delicacy <laughs> in London okay. at the time. So, or not a delicacy, but they were, you know, you wouldn't, you couldn't have eggs all the time because you know only so many eggs were available. That kind mm. of thing. So that uh, that's an interesting. So point. wasn't Mears was Bond kind of bad at his job? Yeah, he's like not... <laughs> he he keeps getting like screwing up, getting caught. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, I I guess you need that for drama, but it it, it adds up. No, it's true. He doesn't. And he doesn't. He often just doesn't die because the villain suddenly decides not to kill him. Right. For no, like Goldfinger, there was no reason for that. Mm. He makes he makes his enemy his secretary to yeah to write out uh, his business plans. You know. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of that where they take Bond into their confidence and haven't quite. You know, is like, and Bond's like, hopefully they didn't notice this British guy when they in one of, in Man with a Golden Gun, they literally know a guy named James Bond is on the island looking for him, but he's already got a new cover that he's gone undercover as, and uh, yeah, it, they, one of the few ones where he uses another name. That's right. Yes, his name is Mark Hazard <laughs> in that one. <laughs> but um, he, yeah, uh, this this noticeable s- six foot tall guy with. Blue eyes and a scar on his cheek. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. My my surprisingly hair suit, six foot tall. Yeah, head. yeah. Um, yeah. He's a really bad infiltrator, and I mean, again, they actually kind of make fun of that in uh, the Casino Royale movie, where they uh, yeah. Vesper creates covers for them, and Bond just goes down and immediately blows and gives his real name, and yeah. like just laughing at her, basically. And uh, anyway, but but yeah, it's he's not. He's he has a tendency to be. This is one of the things about the books. In a lot of stories, of course, the hero's going to get caught. He's going to, you know, the, the tables are going to get turned on him. Things like that are going to happen. But it, uh, the measure to me of a big of a great pulp adventure hero is how does he get out of that? How does he come up with a clever plan? And so often Bond is just saved saved by luck or the hero's being stupid or, or the somebody villain's else taking being stupid. the. Somebody else taking the damage. Yeah. Like Felix Leiter in the second book gets his <laughs> arm and leg eaten by a shark. Right. That doesn't happen in the movies till um uh till uh the Timothy Dalton one, um uh License to Kill. Okay. And that's much later, obviously. That's in the eighties. So right. um that happens in the second book. Mm-hmm. And um it's sharks both time, but it's a different villain. Right. Uh but uh and I mean, he appears again, but with a hook and a peg leg, but right. um, or an artificial leg or whatever. Uh, but uh, and also, uh, Quarrel dies in his second appearance in Doctor No. Right. Um, and uh, uh, there's uh, does uh, his I guess his French connection in Casino Royale he survives, although he, t- yeah. he dies in the novels actually, in the movies actually. Yeah. Uh, but there's um. Yeah, no, he he tends to yeah, and when he's when he's around like he, he gets a local contact who's often kind of at least a more interesting character than him in many cases. Um there's uh uh the guy in um uh Dr. No, what's his, his name, the Jamaican guy who helps Quarrel. him out. Oh, that's Quarrel. Oh, yeah. sorry, is he does he appear more than once? Oh, uh Quarrel is also in uh Live and Let Die. Oh, okay. All right. He's um, a recurring character right. sort of, but he he right. dies in his second appearance, right. and in the movies, he he's obviously killed off in Doctor No, so right. he only has one. But um, in um, a later one, Quarrel Junior appears. Really? Okay. One of the Roger Moore one. It was I think it was Live and Let Die. So okay, 
that would make sense. Yeah. yeah. And then um, he's, uh, yeah, and Jarko Karam uh, gets killed. Yeah, in the, though he, he had it coming, as we discussed earlier. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, he has a tendency, Fleming, to give Bond a companion. Like, there's also uh, both Tiger Tanaka and the Australian guy whose name I forget, Dicko somebody. Yeah, whatever. In, he uh, a jerk. In he only... was talking about how great fascism would be. So. Well, that's exactly it. He, he has, he'll have, give, give John, James Bond a companion who he hangs out with. Uh, who's very gregarious, and he starts spouting every time reactionary political opinion. Darko Karam did. Yeah, I guess Quarrel's the only one who didn't do that. But uh, the all the others were like, "Oh, you you stupid English are giving up your empire, and you should uh, you know you should get rid of those long haired beatniks, and you should like all the all the crusty old reactionary stuff of the yeah. mid nineteen sixties. But he doesn't give it to Bond. He gives it to his his sidekick who's usually not English, but he's commenting on the English yeah. and uh, it, he can't help feeling that it's Fleming kind of having his cake and eat it too. Like he's putting his political opinions out there, but not giving it to James Bond so that, cause he knew there were enough people who would be offended by that if James yeah. Bond felt that way. So, uh, you know, and, and then they'll usually get killed off in some horrible way as well. So usually, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it is, that is a, an interesting aspect to it. So this. yeah, I, like I said earlier, I had started reading Casino Royale uh, a while back, uh, earlier this year, mm-hmm. so not that long ago, but I, I thought I'd start reading it, and uh, I gave up once it uh, described, uh, uh, it was Mathis, the French, the French, uh, the Mathis, leader, yes. yeah, Mathis, um, who um, said uh, of Vesper Lind, she has splendid protuberances, front and back. <laughs> Which is the least sexy way to describe a sexy woman I have ever come across in my life. Yeah, that was pretty hilarious. Protuberances. Protuberances. Like, I don't know if that's the character being, you know, like not knowing English well or... Yeah, it's... That it never gets quite that awkward afterwards, but yeah, honestly, Bond's the jokes are not good, and whenever Bond tries to make a joke too, it doesn't come off as he doesn't do the Bond one-liners in the book. No, also gadgets aren't really a thing. Yeah, there aren't many gadgets and at there's all. There's actually there's actually a, uh, a line in uh, I believe it was um, um, uh, from Russia with Love, where he says, uh, you know. Uh, the Secret Service doesn't really go in for explosives and things. Uh, so, but in the movies, he's got like explosive watches. Even in the gritty ones, he has an explosive watch. And right, Inspector, which I yeah. don't like. But anyway, yeah, yeah, no, it's exactly. It's it's interesting. One of the main things you'd associate with James Bond is that he had all these gadgets, uh, which he barely has. In uh, Hugh I, Branch is a thing, but yes. they they just sort of they fashion a. a carrying case so right. that it has secret compartments and mm-hmm. a knife in it that's that's the closest it gets to a gadget yeah that was that was the coolest thing is he, he's got this case that has all these secret compartments that things and that's in from russia with love is yeah it? yeah um and yeah q, uh, q himself technically makes an appearance because major major boothroyd is q yeah uh, but and he appears in dr no at the beginning right as yeah. he does in the movie i believe yeah but he's in one scene that's his entire appearance in the entire book yeah and in they all mention the book q series. branch but they never call a character q exactly yeah and also the uh he drives a bentley instead of a uh aston martin right that's the aston right. martin does appear and he does drive it in goldfinger mm-hmm. but that's it yeah. Otherwise, it's always the Bentley. Right. Well, I think I think the Aston Martin became again so much of this game became iconic because of the movies. Yeah. And Goldfinger, they there's some really memorable scenes with the Aston Martin, so I think that's why that became yeah. the Bond car uh, because of Goldfinger, um, including the scene where he basically uses it to meet a girl. Basically, that's yeah. that's like the main thing he uses the car for. He doesn't use it for cool spy stuff. And again, there's no gadgets in the car in uh, in the book. But yeah, in the movie, in the movie it's it's bulletproof and as. Right, it has yeah. it has like a razors that come out of the wheels, yeah. Can, or de, it can de hubcap another car. Yeah, and I think it's got an ejector seat. Yep. Uh, all that stuff. That's not in the book. I know there's no ejector seats in the book, which is too bad. It, like I say, it does. The books do veer into. Uh, pulp territory a yeah. lot, and the, Doctor No, Goldfinger, Drax—they are very pulp. Uh, yeah, I it, mean Goldfinger, but even then, uh, say Doctor No's. Um, uh, secret lair. Mm-hmm. They actually explain, sort of, like it's not really convincing, but they explain how he made it. Right. Like how he got his money, how he how he had uh, things transferred to the island and mm-hmm. the the mountain dug out and turned right. into his lair. Yeah. Um. So I mean, it does. <laughs> how did he make his fortune, Phil? Doctor uh, No. Stamps and no. Nope, well, nope. no, no. It was it was stamps. There was stamps involved, but it was it was it was guano. It was. Pr- 
<laughs> yeah, bird, which, bird crap. Bird crap, basically, which is apparently, well, apparently, it's valuable as a fertilizer for a lot yeah. of people. But literally, his empire is b- built on bird. Well, crap. he he originally got stamps that he stole, right? And then he uh, gets richer off of the. He buys the island with that and right. uh, gets rich off the bird crap. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but and and it is like I say, it's interesting because that's that period where I guess Fleming didn't know exactly where the Cold War was going. So, but he liked the idea of a supervillain. First, it's Doctor No, then eventually it's Spectre, run by Blofeld, mm-hmm. who appears in several novels. So, um, even even with uh, uh, Doctor No, he was working with the Russians, but it seemed like he wasn't a Russian agent. He was just sort of using them because they would. Yeah, the it, was, would... it was the idea of someone who could um, uh, basically had a, a super intelligence network that wasn't associated with the Russians, but could he would sell to the highest bidder, mm-hmm. which is interesting because it implies he would sell to the the Britain or America <laughs> if they paid enough. Mm-hmm. Which, but he always says, "Oh no!" But they're always bad, and they always end up giving it to the Russians. And again, the spe- Specter is, uh, which is the special executive for uh, what is it? Control. Oh, I have it written down here. Uh, one second. Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Which, uh, I, if you like, act, well, th- again, that's kind of, that became it's not better a- than what S.H.I.E.L.D. originally stood for, right. which was nonsense. <laughs> yeah, which made no sense. Well, that that's interesting because that became a cliche in the 60s spy f- fan, which was, of course, a huge thing in the 60s. Everything was a spy. There's the man from Uncle. Mm-hmm. Uh, sh- agents, of, uh, you know, uh, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. was originally a reaction to that kind of uh, genre. Yeah. Uh, there's two or three others. Of course, Get Smart was making fun of it. Yeah. But they, you always had to have, uh, m- like, a, a, a an acronym yeah. controlling it. And it was interesting because Spectre is the group that does it, not... Uh, not any of the good guys in this, uh, but yeah, you've always got an evil, you know, E V I L or yeah. something like that. <laughs> well, in the James Bond Junior, which I've seen one episode of, uh-huh. that, that's the one James Bond, you know, screen thing that I haven't really because there's 65 episodes of that. I'm not, <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. It's, it was a cartoon made in the 90s about James Bond's quote nephew, who was named James Bond yes. Junior. Okay, and uh, the villains are named Scum. <laughs> yeah yeah i Which mean that stands for something i can't remember yeah yeah so they they resist i guess it's hard in a kid's cartoon but come on that's his illegitimate son we all know that's yeah a, that's what james yeah. bond jr is nephew yes well that's why i was thinking it, it needed to have he actually um the uh kissy kissy uh what's her name kissy maguchi <laughs> no i don't know kissy uh, something yeah she was the one from uh from say it uh, you only live twice. There we go. Uh, but yeah, she actually, if I'm not mistaken, he get they imply he gets her pregnant at one point. But I can't then it, remember. It doesn't it doesn't go anywhere because he has to leave the island eventually. And um, but so I'm kind of like somebody should make a story about James Bond's half Japanese uh, uh, illegitimate son, basically. Um, so, but he's and plus he's probably got tons of illegitimate children yeah. out there because it's James Bond, obviously. It is, uh, speaking of which, all the, you know, all the, uh, you know, all the, the romancing that he does, uh, James Bond's at first, at least he's a bit like Captain Kirk, uh, where we have this idea that, oh, he's this big Lothario, he gets lots of girls, but it's actually just kind of the nature of the stories that, uh, they weren't heavily serialized at the time, either the novels or Star Trek, it was episode by episode. So it would just be, oh, he needs a love interest in this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he'd have a love interest. And uh, it wasn't necessary, but, and because you, they pile up, it's like, well, he's got a new girl in every story, but it's just, they're kind of resetting at every story and he's got a new well, love interest. Well, they sort of, I mean, more than the movies do at least, they sometimes mention what happened to them. Right. Or that he, he's thinking about them. Yeah. Like uh, the uh, Tiffany Case from uh, Diamonds Are Forever, which is the fourth mm-hmm. book, I believe. Yeah. Uh, she's mentioned in the next book. Right. Uh, yeah, he does mention. Yeah, yeah and they broke. They were going to get married, and they broke up. Mm-hmm. Um, they had fights, and she right. married somebody else. And uh, he mentions solitaire later on. Right. She was from the from uh, Live and Let Die. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he wonders what happens to her. Same with uh, uh, right. Honey Chow Rider from Doctor No. Yeah, she comes back eventually. No, and no, then, she doesn't come back. Or, uh, he, he met in her in his thoughts. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he also has uh, Mary Goodnight who's. He doesn't ever sleep with, but it's sort of like the money penny of the book. Well, there's right. there's a few. Right. Money penny is in the books, and mm-hmm. they do flirt. Mm-hmm. But um, Bond's actual secretary, not M's secretary, 
He originally has uh, Luilia Ponsonby, which yeah. is apparently somebody Fleming knew. So it was, <laughs> okay. it was a real name. Oh, but really? But it's a terrible name. It is. Um, sorry, any Luilia Ponsonbys <laughs> who are listening. Um, not uh, even a Bond girl name either. It's not a ridiculous yeah. Bond girl name. It's just a, a strange name. Yeah. But uh, she was his secretary that he was always flirting with. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, she gets replaced at one point by Mary Goodnight. Right. Uh, who fulfill, fulfills the same role, so I don't know why they didn't just use the same one. But Yeah, I guess he just felt there had to be some feeling of change or whatever going on in the series. But yeah, and th- she's really the money penny, as we know her, is yeah. uh, is Leolia, Loelia Ponsonby. Yeah. And, uh, and money penny is a very, very yeah. minor character in the Very books. minor. She's, I mean, she does flirt with Bond, but it's everybody does, yeah, exactly. supposedly. He's apparently the most attractive man in the world because he looks like Hoagie Carmichael, <laughs> who, I mean, I'm not saying he was a bad looking dude, but he, I looked at pictures of him and he just looked like, you know, a guy. Yeah. Like well, this isn't, it's not exactly, you know, Robert Redford when he was young or, you mm-hmm. know, Brad Pitt when he was young. He's got that star quality, Phil. <laughs> that's just what, you can't explain it, but that's how it works sometimes. Um, but yeah, no. And um, so. Oh, also uh, we we talked about his consumption. He smokes 70 cigarettes a day. <laughs> he does. And he even starts mentioning that it's affecting his his uh, ability yeah. well, to perform later on. Well, it would. 70. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, by by the last book, yeah, I think he's, he's down cut to down. 10. He's, he's down There's, to But he, he says he's trying to get down to 10, but he right. still smokes about 20. And again, that's probably something that Ian Fleming himself was talking about. But yeah, I mean, that was the era when people smoked a lot. If we've yeah, all but seen the, Mad Men. how could he? How could he move <laughs> upstairs, much less action scenes? Well, he's. I mean, he's fairly young, but you can see that is actually uh, kind of interesting that it's catching up with him as the books go on. You I can guess. see him. He's and again that people. Uh, People have commented about Ian Fleming that his, you know, his outlook was getting, you know, he was aging, obviously, and he was just getting a little grimmer in his thoughts and stuff, and that does kind of per- turn into the book sometimes. So, uh, we didn't talk about Blofeld much. Right. Uh, uh, he's, uh, he's obviously uh, the leader of Spectre, and he's introduced in Thunderball, which was actually uh, uh, written originally as a screenplay mm-hmm. by uh, Fleming and some other people. Right. And uh, that caused some rights problems when Flem- when it- Fleming just wrote it as a book. Right. Because the screenplay never took off. It was before any of the movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's why there was um, uh, Never Say Never Again, which was uh, Sean Connery coming back to Bond. Right. But it's actually a remake of Thunderball. Right. As with Casino Royale... It was a case where the brights were kind of up in the air. James yeah, Bond was so huge, that's why so somebody stopped, else swept him yeah, and bought that's it. why they stopped using Blofeld and Spectre in the movies. Right. Because they, they lost the rights to them until uh, yeah. until Eon, uh, Eon, sorry, Eon uh, Films picked it up again for mm-hmm. Spectre, which... Yeah, didn't turn out that well, but whatever. Yeah. No, yeah, no, but, the, yeah. yeah. That's the thing, because because Th- Blofeld's Bond's big nemesis, and he doesn't really get a proper ending in the movies because they had to stop using him. Yeah, uh, I mean, he gets a, a guy who looks exactly like him, but never has his name mentioned, gets thrown down a chimney eventually. at the beginning of a movie. At yeah. the beginning, yeah, which is a pretty lame way to finish off his arch nemesis. They've now brought back, brought him back in the Daniel Craig, the as last his one, secret brother, <laughs> his secret brother, it which is. is uh, well, ha- you know, adopted, br- whatever. Yeah, it was I, bad. It was. It was a waste of uh, waste of uh, uh, Christoph, Christoph Waltz, Waltz and yeah. uh, Blofeld as a character. But yeah, what was weird about uh, Blofeld, I found he's introduced his first act, his first kill in the books mm-hmm. is killing a rapist, right? Um, which is not the best way to show that your bad guy mean you know is evil and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, you know. Yeah, it, didn't, it just makes me sympathize with him. Well, didn't you? Say, yeah, you 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 were saying it's like, and then he kills another rapist. Yeah, later in, on. The, in his le, in his second book, the, his first kill and his second appearance uh-huh. is is another rapist. Right. Uh, in both cases, they were disrupting his plans or whatever. But still, yeah. it's yeah, it was one of his men, and he was like, "No, you don't. You aren't maintaining discipline among the troops, yeah. so I have to kill you." And you, well, it, he had promised a kidnap victim that uh, that, uh, or he, he had promised her parents that she wouldn't be harmed. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and it turns out that she had had sex or been raped by, by one right. of her men. So he, yeah, by one of his men. So uh, I, d- I think him. he just came on. I don't think he actually raped her. I think he just he was trying to. I think it was a little bit ambiguous, but yeah. still, it's you know because she's talking about it afterwards anyway. But it, but yes, it's and and then you were you made you made the crack as like well if he hates rapists that's why he hates James Bond yeah. so much. <laughs> but. Uh, 
yeah anyway yeah blofeld is uh, uh i've I, and i this is something else i was mentioning in tw- on, on twitter the other day it's like they had actual communists in the early going in the books then it's like like as in the the russian the soviet union uh, then it just becomes sort of the supervillains who are working with the russians and in the movies they kind of they become politically almost completely irrelevant. It's just some crazy supervillain who wants to do yeah. crazy supervillain things, and it's it there. That's kind of interesting because it's and then in the eighties a bit they started bringing them back the Russian angle because you know the oh, whole okay. Reagan Thatcher thing. Right. I haven't seen uh, either the Dalton one, so I well, don't really uh, know, but... a view to a kill yeah. uh, sort of brings that up because yeah. the villains uh, more. I mean, the villain was Christopher Walken, but he was raised Russian. Right. Um. I. That was terrible. I can't remember much about that. Um, but uh, the Timothy Dalton ones... Timothy Dalton, by the way, is my favorite Bond actor, so take that how you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I just really liked his performance. Yeah. Um, and I liked uh, License to Kill a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's underrated, I think. Yeah, I've never seen those ones. But, but uh, it... License to Kill, less so, but uh, Living Daylights is definitely based around uh, a defector. Right. But it is interesting, though, that just that they bring in all the... the like. In many ways, just as in the early days of superheroes, they would fight like strange, like German types who were often mad scientists, but they couldn't actually fight Nazis because they weren't in the people didn't want to drag them into World War II just just yet because they hadn't officially gone to war yet. And so they you get these crypto Nazis who keep showing up. So you keep seeing crypto commies show up in the James mm-hmm. Bond series, and it's and that's kind of a major thing with these idea of these world shaking supervillains that they're you know they want to disrupt the world order because they're communists basically. And then even before like uh, even when it doesn't make sense like goldfinger yeah exactly it's a often... guy who's literally obsessed with currency yeah it becomes yeah it just doesn't well like work. i say it's it's from the viewpoint of you know the sort of imperialist power going what are these people they're crazy they want to disrupt everything and they must be greedy and you know like they don't it's it's almost an attempt to edit out the ideology and just make them big super villains basically yeah. so it's but it's that subtextual thing of like yeah we're gonna disrupt the world and change mm-hmm. everything oh and even yeah. specter to i mean it has uh it has ex smash agents in it right um and, and ex nazis uh, yeah ex gestapo <laughs> people and right uh, <laughs> just criminals from around the world but uh mm-hmm. uh yeah yeah, it's it's it, he it's kind of just all this it, when the Simpsons did I'm under attack by commie Nazis. That was definitely uh, yeah. reflecting the bond. It was just oh they're villains out there. They're foreign. Yeah, weirdos. the Drax thing made no sense. <laughs> yeah, like they could have just not had the Russian yeah. submarine in that. And well, I mean to be fair, Stalin and Hitler did team up very briefly or whatever. So it's not like they were they had this strong ideology. Yeah, but after about the not, war, yeah, I I know it's it's just again kind of a well they're all bad because they're not us basically attitude. Mm. Anyway, I think we've got to wrap it up. We're yeah. pretty uh, far along. So, um, uh, we'll, oh, uh, uh, would you recommend these books? <laughs> I only as a historical curio. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're 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 often kind of boring, to be honest. Yeah, a lot of what's been done uh, has been done better later or even before because he's sort of in the spirit of, as I said, Sherlock Holmes and some of the mm-hmm. other uh, things. Um, you know, uh, uh, they were written pretty fast. Um, they're they're obviously major cultural artifacts uh, yeah so there's that aspect that's the most interesting aspect to me uh of those of but the i mean books. 14 books was a lot to get through for me and <laughs> yeah i mean i have stuff i didn't like so yeah, yeah. it's it's started to really great after a while so yeah. i i don't recommend reading the whole series maybe yeah. pick up one or two if you think they sound interesting read casino royale read from russia with love maybe moonraker if you want it over the top and if you want the I, i'd go with uh, uh dr no as well it's racist as hell but uh yeah. It's got some goofiness. Maybe yeah. Goldfinger. Um, anyway, uh, this podcast was uh, conceived and hosted by Adam Prosser and Philip Rice. It was produced by Alex Ross. And the theme song was written by Jack Fierick. If you've enjoyed this, check out our Patreons. Subscribers get to listen to the show a week early. Plus, you get lots of other neat stuff, including our comics and art. Uh, the Patreons are, again, Adam Prosser and Philip Rice on Patreon.com. Those on our Facebook page and Instagram are linked to at neversleepsnetwork.com slash series slash what dash slash what dash mad dash universe. And you can subscribe to our RSS feed there as well. So from Toronto with love, hopefully we leave you stirred but not shaken and we live to die another day. Also, Octopussy. Good night. Good night.